Welcome to the NCT Data Science Seminar. This event is something special as it is hosted by HIDA, Hits for Health, Alice Light, and the NCT Data Science Seminar communities. A warm welcome to all the representatives. A warm welcome also to Julia Schnabel, our speaker today. We are really happy to have you here. Before we start, I have to announce that the seminar today will be recorded and the video record will be published later on our YouTube channel. If you have questions, please use the chat function or raise your hand. As last time, there will be a short HIDA presentation and afterwards, Lena Meyerhein will take over as the host of this event. Victoria, now the stage is yours. Yeah, welcome everybody also from our HIDA side. Um, we are the Helmholtz Information and Data Science Academy. And um, from, for those who are not joining from the Helmholtz Cosmos today, um, Helmholtz is Germany's largest scientific research organization. And um, HIDA is part of it and connect, connects as a roof of six data science research schools. And so that is Germany's largest postgraduate training network. Um, here you can see our six Helmholtz information and data science schools throughout Germany, and the Hits for Health is, of course, one of our schools. So if you're interested in the other schools or have, want to have more information, I will share um, later on some links in the chat. Um, what are we doing as HIDA? Apart from the research our um, research schools are doing, we are promoting and uh, providing financial support to all Helmholtz institutions with different training and network opportunities. And we offer, of course, exchange and visiting programs, which you can also find on our website. We are doing a lot of uh, HIDA networking events, such career days. We will soon have a career day on health as well, and I will share the invitation link later on also in the chat. Um, and of course, we have um, on our website um, very interesting opportunities for jobs um, in the field of data science from all our um, centers. And if you want to know more about HIDA, you can follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and subscribe to our newsletter and, of course, explore our website. So uh, with that said, um, I wish you a lot of uh, fun today with our lecture and yeah, follow us and keep you posted. Thanks, Victoria. Now let's move on to the actual scientific content. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Julia Schnabel to you. Many of you will know that she's actually one of the most famous medical imaging researchers worldwide. Um, she's actually, I have to look at my notes, uh, a professor of computational imaging and AI in medicine at Technical University of Munich, also director of the new Institute of Machine Learning and Biomedical Imaging at Helmholtz Center Munich, and has a secondary appointment as chair in computational imaging at King's College London. Um, she graduated in computer science from Technical University of Berlin. Then she left Germany for a while, uh, did a PhD in computer science at UCL in the UK, then joined the University of Oxford, where she became full professor, actually. I hope I get it all right, Julia. <laughs> and then uh, finally went to uh, King's College London. And now we're very, very glad to have her back in Germany. Um, because she's very famous, she's elected fellow of IEEE, of Alice, of the Mika Society, won many awards. Actually, in Alice, I have to mention that she's one of the uh, about a dozen yeah, founding fellows uh, for AI and health. So ba basically, she's one of the few or was one of the few representatives of AI and health in Europe. Um, yeah, I personally got to know Julia on the Mikai board, where we both serve. She's now uh, the executive secretary. And I was always very impressed uh, with several aspects. Uh, one was that she always fought for students, always wanted to give uh, students more money for traveling, more rights, more whatever, also for diversity, not only in gender, also in, in, in other aspects. And that's probably also one of the reasons that she was one of those that actually now brought Mikai to Africa. This is very special. You have to know that yeah, Mika is the main medical imaging society worldwide and the bidding 
process is very competitive. Like in, Olymp in the Olympics, you have to submit a proposal and that year, and I was on the board, so I really know, it was so, so competitive. Uh, but yeah, she and her team, they made it. And Mikai goes Africa. So Julia is really a person who, who wants to include minorities and yeah, who wants to bring everybody together. And um, also she's never afraid, I have to say that, to bring up delicate issues that are controversial and that, that just need saying. And I really appreciated that always about you. I wanted her to become president, uh, but she rejected maybe I will succeed sometime in the future. Um, anyway, uh, in German, you would say she, she has a Herz am rechtes Leg. I don't know how to say it in, in English, but I'm very glad Julia is here with us today. And yeah, the stage is yours. Wow, thank you very much, Lena. I'm duly, duly um, humbled and embarrassed. Um, I could just say right back at you. I think it's been a fantastic time working with you on the on the Mika board. And uh, well, I miss you there. Um, let me just see where that works. Um, wow, um, some of these issues will come up. Um, I had some some background on me, so this is the full story. But I think Lena, you got everything right. I'm getting confused these days myself. Um, I still have a one foot in the UK, um, despite um, now being here in Munich. Um, and I've got all these things. One, one thing I just wanted to point out, I've joined HIDA STEER, so the steering committee of, of HIDA. So I get to see a lot of the different graduate schools. In fact, this is the third one I'm, I'm, I'm talking to. I talked to Madata and to Mats, the Munich School of Data Science, of course. And for me, it's a great opportunity to connect with lots of researchers all across Germany. So for me, this is a, a real pleasure. And, and you know, Lena is one of my prime people in Germany anyway. So this is, this is great to be here today. Um, just where I am. So um, Munich isn't such a big town after London, but it's it's big enough that I still get in some good cycling distances in. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, at, at, at TUM, I'm out in the, in the research campus in Garching in, in the informatics department, uh, which is a bit of a, a ride. It's 45, 50 minutes. Um, the Helmholtz Center is located right next to the Bayern Munich training campus. So just to give you some orientation. Um, I still have my satellite group in London and most of the work, I'm, or actually all of the work I'm presenting today is still from, from that group as I'm still building up my, my lab in Munich, but it's growing on the right hand side. You see more and more faces coming and supervising co-supervising new PhDs and my first postdocs are finally starting next month. So here are some of my, of my disclosures. Uh, the work I'm presenting today was uh, funded by um, uh, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK um, and the grant is called Smart Heart. Uh, I'll talk a bit about at the end who's, who's involved in that. What I want to talk today uh, uh, about is what I call AI-enabled imaging. So in medical imaging, we usually fall into some of these categories. We either acquire images, so we generate some raw data using some imaging sensor, an MR scanner, or an ultrasound probe. Then we we construct that, or we, we construct images, so we transform the raw data into some image suitable for viewing by radiologists. Or I actually come more from the image post-processing group. It's, it's actually a um, a uh, name I don't like so much, it's more image analysis actually now these days, but it's kind of a mix of filtering, segmenting, registering images, but also doing some more, some more complicated things like constructing models for detection, classification of diseases. And then finally, of course, there's the image interpretation by clinicians. Now you've got this whole pipeline here of imaging from sensor to the clinician. And machine learning is great. It can be applied quite modularly along um, at all these different components on the imaging pipeline. But you know, it's not really linking across that much yet. And this is what I'm really excited about because machine learning really has the power to bridge those gaps and do things more jointly and even end to end. So uh, the background, I've, I've met some of the students at HITS for Health because I'm also on the advisory board of, of, of FITS. Um, so it was really great to get to know even though on Zoom and the pandemic and again now on Zoom. Um, but some of you I know don't have that background. Some of you are a bit more experimental. So you, you're quite nice, nice mix of people, but the focus of course is on data science. So you have to acquire data. Machine learning was really, um, I think hit, hit it off most with computer vision, that's still the case. Um, first, there was artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. Actually, deep learning is not a new concept. Actually, I did my undergraduate degree, um, only that computers were still a bit slow and we didn't have that much annotated data, but we already worked on 
on, on MNIST data and back propagation, all these things, uh, convolution neural networks were just starting at the time. But ImageNet also came in, in, 20, in the 2010s only, that actually enabled a lot of new things. And of course, GPUs came and, and people could you know, detect strawberries and records and traffic lights all of a sudden. The network architectures are of course quite varied. The simplest one would be like this uh, simple encoder style architecture for a simple classification task, detecting dogs and cats and or regressing, regressing things as well. Um, of course, you can then go into an encoder-decoder architecture, so you kind of compress everything into a bottleneck, have this kind of lower dimensional space, and then you bubble all the way up again to, for example, do pixel-wise classification for segmentation, users for restoration and other tasks. So this is very, very simple, basic, um, just illustrative deep learning for you. In medical imaging, and here I'm showing cardiac imaging, of course, we need to um, be a bit more um, but considerate and respectful of the data. It's not just photography, even though photography is complicated on its own. It's, it's, it's about patient anatomy, patient physiology, patient pathology. And of course, um, the actual acquisition is quite, quite different. There's imaging physics um, involved as well, which we need to think about. Um, but in principle, we can use a lot of the same things. So in medical imaging, we're very good in stealing ideas from computer vision. So we do all these things. We restore images, we, we, we reconstruct images, we classify images, uh, do regression tasks, and of course, segmentation. This is where UNET, the one I'm showing here, was really lifting up. And that's actually a MICA paper, which is quite nice. I think over 32,000 citations from Olaf von der Berger. Um, I think it was mentioned before, if you, if I'm too fast or skipping over things, please um, make yourself known, raise your hand or, or um, feel free to interrupt. So why do we want to do AI enabled imaging? Well, in, we've got lots of challenges in, in medical imaging, which make, makes machine learning quite difficult to apply. We've got sometimes very poor quality data. There are artifacts, there's patient motion. We don't have these not large evacuated annotated data sets. Um, uh, there's also a lot of um, well, legal logistical frameworks, which don't allow us to get easy access to hospital data and for good reason as well, but it's frustrating at times. Clinical data is just really very varied. We've got lots of differences across different scanning systems. We've got a domain shift. I mentioned that a bit towards the end. And of course, there's this black box approach. We've got this lack of interpretability, so it's hard to sell this to radiologists sometimes. So yeah, I wanna talk about applying machine learning along the imaging pipeline from acquisition to interpretation. And these approaches, as I mentioned, can be modular or increasingly integrated and even end-to-end. -end. And cardiac MR, because of the smart heart grant was, was our main, main starting point here. And my focus in that grant is on image quality control. So really thinking about how good are the images? Are they good enough? Uh, can we restore the quality? Can we still rescue them? Do we have to discard them? And then that actually opens up a lot of new avenues in image reconstruction of MRI, in image segmentation and analysis, and also the domain shift. So um, senior cardiac MRI in particular is routinely acquired for the assessment of cardiac health. It's great. You've got these videos of almost videos of the, of the heart beating. Um, but here the quality, if you just think about quality issues, you've got the underlying MR physics to take care of. Uh, there's this trade-off between signal to noise. So um, the better the images get in terms of actual quality, the lower the temporal resolution will get and the other way around. So you have to trade off these two things. Um, then there's also the patient physiology to think about. Um, there's the beating heart, of course, that's what we want to image. Patients breathe, <laughs> which is good, but not helpful in terms of imaging. They are patients, so they uh, struggle having a consistent breath hold. And of course, they're lying in the scanner for 20, 30 minutes, and they will be just moving about as well. Which means that images are of poor quality. Um, then they need to be discarded, or the annotations will be impacted and wrong. Uh, so the, the diagnosis actually might uh, be impacted as well. Or we need to recall patients, which affects not only the hospital workflow, but it also delays the diagnosis. So 
if we want to apply AI in this in this domain, we usually want some really good high quality data and annotations, large well curated databases, which you know is is the tricky bit. But uh, thankfully, there was this initiative in the UK a couple of years back, um, and is still ongoing, where they are scanning. Uh, 100,000 volunteers uh, for brain, heart, and body imaging across dedicated centers in the UK. And um, it's very tight quality control and scan consistency. And it's, it's really a very nice data set. Everybody can get access to that. Now they charge some money, but it's not too bad. But I think it's good value for money, actually. You get really good access and you get really see high quality images here. There's a German equivalent called NACO, the National Cohort. Um, which is only 30,000. Um, I think access might be a bit more tricky there, but I think we're getting here in Germany as well. Uh, one thing to bear in mind, as Nina talked about diversity, um, this is across the UK cohort. So um, it's basically uh, UK residents between 40 and 70 years old, I think, predominantly healthy. Some of them, of course, might have some conditions. Of course, the UK the population is a little bit more diverse than the German population, so that, that's good. So it's a bit more heterogeneous, um, but um, it's not all from London, the data. It's also from North England, so then it becomes a bit less diverse. So the problem, of course, is, yeah, we can do great stuff on high quality data, but in the end, we want to go to real patient data, where we've got all these problems in contestant breath holes, uh, hospital workflows, which don't work that well, scanners of different quality and so on. So we have to bridge that gap um, to, to make our, our work useful for clinicians in the end. So the first step in that, in that pipeline would be to think about image quality assessment. So is, is the image good enough? Do we need to rescan the patient? We could also use that step to actually establish, curate a training database. So we actually can go through hospital data and say good, bad, you know, um, a bit like Cinderella <laughs> sorting piece from, I don't know what you were sorting things from actually. Um, so basically, basically just putting things into, into different database, the ones you can use and the ones which are not useful, unfortunately. Next step, of course, would be a bit more ambitious, which is and say, well, having established which data sets are not very good, um, could we still rescue them? Could we avoid patients having to be recalled? Could we not delay diagnosis, still get something out of those data and actually, could we even improve further downstream tasks or segment classify diseases and so on? And then, of course, for me, the ultimate goal, and we're not quite there yet, but I think we're working towards that, is to uh, accelerate imaging, to stop imaging when the image quality is good enough for the diagnosis that we need, which would actually help to scan more patients in the same amount of time, or not only pushing through more patients, but allow more dynamic time for patients who actually need extra scans, identify those more quickly and say, we need a bigger scan time for those. And for those where we actually can exclude whatever we wanted to exclude, we're done already. We don't have to go through these extra protocols. So it's a bit more like doing a bit more like a patient specific scanning setup. And the first thing is, as I showed in the beginning, is classifying the, the good from the bad. So we can show networks good and bad quality images and, and train it in a supervised fashion and, and get a usually quite good answer. And that's the same as classifying dogs or cats in an image. So there's not, not much different there. The first thing my, my postdoc at the time, Ilka Oxus, who's now a, a lecturer in, in Istanbul, was to think about uh, scan planning. So that's that's a big problem. If you want to do a four chamber view in cardiac MRI, you have to do two other scans before you even get there. So you have to do a two chamber view um, as shown here and then a short axis view. So actually just going um, perpendicular to that. Then you have to put these lines through and only with those lines, you can actually plan the four chamber view. So you need to have this appropriate angle. You need to exclude the aorta as well. And it does go wrong. It actually goes wrong more often than you would think in a, in a normal hospital setting. And if, if it does go wrong, you've got these off-axis images, these kind of false five-chamber look images, uh, which where the um, left ventricular outflow tract is, is uh, visible. And that um, then gives prob uh, results and difficulties in atrial analysis. So in these cases, the patient would need to be called back in, the diagnosis would be delayed, that's not good. You want to actually ideally detect that at scan time and say actually we have to repeat the scan immediately. 
but so we did this retrospectively instead. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of things to consider. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not only about um, pushing images through, it's also locating where the heart is in the images. So you actually do some object detection. You can use your, again, your favorite um, network to do that, or you can do just template matching as we did in the, in the good old times to get your 2D data set. And then you train a very, very simple um, network. In this case, it's actually almost the original Lynette uh, from Jan Lecun, uh, where you just train for LVRT present or not. So poor quality or, or bad quality. Um, now we were faced with the problem though, UK Biobank is a, is a really good high quality data set um, that we had very few of those poor quality images, very few of the LVOT images, false five chamber look images, but we found 123. Um, so we did just a balanced set of 123 good quality images. We would have had, you know, 80,000 more or so, and, and those, those few um, poor quality images. Of course, we did the usual data augmentation, just, you know, just jiggle around images just to give a bit more variation in the training. We had five temporal frames of each sequence, um, kept them, of course, separate, um, either in the training or in the test set, um, that gave us 615 images for each class, and it as, as you stretched for data, tenfold cross-validation just to boost the, um, the, the performance a bit. And what we also did is, because that was a time when I was still not convinced by deep learning, I was still a skeptic at the time. And we say, well, I could start with machine learning first, let's see how far good we can get with things like random forests or support vector machines and so on. But I was very soon convinced actually even with this little trick, the bit of data augmentation, we got like an accuracy of 80%, adding data um, augmentation 82% and precision and recall were also quite good. So as I was still skeptic, um, Ilka Oxus had to kind of convince me a little bit and said, well, let's look a little bit inside of the network, what, what happens in with these attention maps on which the classification is based. So this is an LVRT um, image, a, a bad one. This is a good quality image. Just looking at the attention maps, you could see actually the LVRT attention map focuses directly where the LVRT is present, where the good quality attention map focuses more on the separation between the heart chambers. This was kind of just a bit of a glimpse in the attempt or first attempt at explainability, but it's important to actually question what your network does. The next step was um, to think, well, if you've got poor quality images, can we go from poor quality to good quality? With LVRT, we can't, of course, because the scan has been acquired in the wrong way in the first place. So we can't undo time there. We can't just, you know, virtually put the patient back in the scanner because we would really have to recall them. But at least we can detect it and maybe detect it in real time and keep the patient in the scanner. But if, if there is a motion in the, in the data set like this, could we actually go from poor quality to high quality image? So actually, radiologists can at least view those images. And this is just um, some, some example of gen more general motion here. Um, but with motion, we've been working for ages on respiratory motion models, also in image navigation. I'm sure Lena has done <laughs> her contributions to that field as well, because the problem is, of course, you want to do guidance and you want to you know, compensate for motion in real time, ideally. Um, the problem is here in this case, it's motion which is within an image. It's not just between images, so that registration doesn't help. It's motion within an image. Could we actually um, understand where this motion actually comes from and could we do something about it? So here you see a good quality image on the left, really nice crisp myocardium, bright blood pool. You see the, the, the papillary muscles and, and so on. And then on the right hand side, you see a motion artifact image. Now, first, on the first view, if you are not used to those images, you might just think it's just a bit poorer contrast, a bit smaller heart and looks a bit fuzzy. Yeah, it does. It looks a bit blurry, which means that um, what you actually see is uh, 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 several um, phases of the heart at the same time, almost superimposed. So you don't see end systole or uh, end diastole, you see some mush up in between, which is not what you want. If you want to calculate, for example, in the end ejection fraction or some other parameter, clinical parameter of interest. And the reason for this is 
to understand actually how these images are acquired. So you do ECG triggering normally, and you acquire not just one cardiac frame per frame, you acquire several lines of case space, basically the raw data over several heartbeats and over different parts of the of the cardiac cycle at the same time. So you've got these, these, um, these lines for frame I, time, time I basically, um, but that's also done over several breathing cycles and over several heart cycles, but always at the same part of the heart cycle approximately um, and until you're done with all frames and, and have done, I don't know, a couple of breathing cycles and cardiac cycles. And of course, if everything goes well, you would just do your inverse Fourier transform and get to your nice high quality images. But if you do, if something goes wrong with the trigger, you're not quite sure at which part of the cardiac phase you are at any one time, which means some of those lines can get mixed up. Um, and then if you then do your inverse Fourier transform, you will get these kind of mushed up images where you see this kind of different several cardiac phases at the same time. Um, now that we understand how that works, well, we've got tons and tons of high quality data from UK Biobank, we can actually make them look worse. We're really good at making really good images look not very nice if you wanted to. The other direction is the difficult one. So we've got these tens of thousands, almost 100,000 high quality images of volunteers. We are more likely to have these poor quality images um, due to patients being imaged in the clinic. But to bridge that gap going from UK Biobank algorithms um, to, to algorithms we can deploy in the clinic, we actually need to take into account that poorer quality or recover that poor quality and make it look high quality. Now, if we start mixing up lines of case space, that's easy, we can do that. We can just go back into case space. Technically, I mean, there might be some MR physicists here. We don't have the phase images, we only have the magnitude. Um, so we have to do some tricks there, but ideally we would have the raw case space data. We should not, not throw it away, but it's usually thrown away. Unfortunately, you have only the reconstructed images on UK Biobank, but we can do, apply different levels of corruption. We can mix up different cycles, different uh, across different frames. We can deliberately corrupt. So we can go from really high, nice quality images to poor quality images. Now we know this way is basically a physics, MR physics motivated, explainable data augmentation, which we can then exploit to, to augment the data in, in our restoration methods. This is basically analogous to data augmentation and computer vision, where we would wriggle around some cats and rotate them and zoom in, right? Only here it's, it's really physics based, it's not just random translations, rotations. We can do that in addition, of course. So the idea is now to say, okay, we know lines of case space are wrong. We're not just train models to just against good, you know, going from bad images to good images because we can now, you know, deteriorate them and can no can go back with a simple encoder decoder architecture back to the to good image. We can actually even exploit that further. If you think about how um, MR images are acquired when you want to be fast, you would do undersampling. You would not acquire dense uh, case space anymore. You would apply some undersampling trajectory and just acquire percentage um, of lines, maybe going down to 25% or 10% even. Um, and then there's lots of works which have, have focused on that, where you use an undersampling trajectory, acquire an undersample case space, get a poor quality image, but at the same time do a data consistency too, because you can again simulate an undersampled case space from a fully sampled case space, apply some reconstruction network and get a high resolution fully sampled reconstruction. Yeah, there will be some loss. The, uh, the trick here is to really overcome um, uh, the, the, the violation of the Nyquist uh, frequency theorem. Um, and that's when neural networks are really nice. You know, they, they try to, to overcome that for you. If you would just do um, undersampled in the Fourier transform, you would get these, these horrid artifacts. But we can apply this now because we now have a fully sampled acquisition, only that some of those lines in case space are wrong. They're just sorted in the wrong way. So we have a fully sampled acquisition, uh, but we can detect which lines, we can train networks to detect which lines are wrong. Once we've detected those wrong lines, we can throw them away, uh, discard them, and then formulate basically this, this uh, motion reconstruction problem and undersampling reconstruction problem. By having uh, thrown away all the corrupt lines of case space, we basically just have an uncorrupted undersampled case space and then actually can do our MR reconstruction and get a 
fully sampled reconstruction artifact corrected. It's actually an unassampled reconstruction now because we've thrown away lines of case space, but you get really good quality images. Now, one thing is of course nice. We have, um, we've got nice images now. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the next step is actually to do maybe something useful with those images. And, and one thing is just to say, okay, we, we um, uh, compensate for the motion, we get really nice quality images, and then we can segment them, for example. Yeah, so we can actually see what happens. So if we've got a high quality image, we get a really nice unit and then unit um, uh, segmentation out of that. Um, that's that's not a problem normally. If we have used here in this case an artificially degraded image, uh, um, uh, with subsequent segmentation will fail. Right, so we can measure that. That's 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 very easy. We can measure failure quite well. Um, but we could actually do better than that. We could actually say, well, we don't only want to rescue images, go from bad images to good images, and then apply a segmentation. We could actually do both at the same time. We can have uh, deliberately complex networks these days. So we can, even in this case, I'm not just putting in one 2D image, I'm putting in one whole time series of 2D images um, as a 3D input. We actually then use a reconstruction network uh, with the artifact detection as before. Only this time it's over the whole time series. So we detect all wrong case baselines across the time series. In the ideal world, I would reshuffle those lines and put them in and slot them back in, in the right place. Um, but we never got there. And some might, lines might just be missing in, in, in a real scenario anyway. Um, and you can do this, I'm, I'm not putting these technical details here, we do use a recurrent network approach here. So we, we actually couple with that the time series together and exploit redundancy between the different case spaces. Um, so we get it as a 3D output, uh, um, our, our undersampling trajectory, then can do our reconstruction, and then we can put a segmentation network in there as well. Your favorite one, UNET, and then UNET, uh, whatever you want. And we just put this all into one joint training objective. It's if you've been around for so long as, as I have, you will see is like these, these loss functions. They look like basically like our cost functions, which we used in segmentation like, like ages ago. This is the problem is then to balance these hyperparameters weighting the different terms in the end. But you get with this. Uh, both a reconstructed image and a segmentation. You might even skip the reconstruction step if you wanted to, because you're just interested in the segmentation. That would be an end-to-end -end learning approach. But here you see some examples on the bottom. You see some deliberately corrupted image, the difference from the original uncorrupted image and um, not a very good segmentation. On the right-hand side, you see a recovered uh, reconstruction, much better difference image still with some differences you see the especially at the at the segmentation boundaries and then the segmentation. So there was this issue is should we just uh, do sequential, um, you know, one after the other or do it should we do it um, training or should we do it end to end and of course you can look at this you can um, uh, do it in a retrospective study you can um, create artifact images, look at the difference from the original one, segment the images and it looks bad. If you do motion reconstruction, just followed by a segmentation at the middle column, you get quite nice segmentation. The reconstruction doesn't look that much better, I find. But if you do it jointly, and that was for me really some nice finding, not only is the segmentation better, but also the reconstruction looks nice because now the reconstruction has focused on the segmentation objective. So actually it looks to me almost like some nonlinear um, blurring has happened, which makes which helps the segmentation. So the reconstruction is now more suitable for the segmentation task. If your objective would have been something different, like a classification task, the reconstruction probably would look different again, right? So it's actually you have to think about for what purpose do you want to do these different steps? Yeah? And so you might have to train networks with different objectives. But we also, <laughs> one reviewer actually, I think insisted, reviewer two, I'm sure, um, to say, why well, can you do it prospectively, right? So can you can you actually show it on real data? We had shown on real retrospective data that we get some better results um, 
uh, by, by uh, really taking real corrupted data where we did not know the case-based trajectory, but still ran it through our network and we got some, some nicer results. Whether they're correct or not, of course, we don't know. They look more plausible, certainly. But here we put a volunteer in the scanner and did deliberate ECG mistriggering, but we also acquired a really high quality scan, you know, young, young clinical fellow who can hold their breath for, for ages. Um, so that, that uh, actually gives us both real good quality and real poor quality data. So here are just some examples uh, of this of this series. So we've got on the left an, uh, a deliberate mistriggering result. It's the actual acquisition, which looks that bad. And the segmentation result was still does surprisingly well, but not, not perfect. Then we did the motion reconstruction just followed by segmentation, which looks nice. Then we did the joint motion reconstruction segmentation, which but both look better, both the reconstruction and the segmentation. And on the right column, you see the corresponding good quality image. Of course, not the same image as we would have obtained uh, in our joint or uh, sequential model because it's different acquisition in the first place, but you see they look actually quite similar. Actually, I think ours looks better, but I'm, I'm biased. So in a way, this method actually has also the potential to be a generic image reconstructor because we used also on good quality images and actually improved signal to noise ratio and other things. Um, but of course, with the segmentation in mind, so it's maybe better if you want to do a segmentation, if you want to do something else, you may have to train on a, on a different objective. We went a little bit further um, just to think about image quality control, how it put, works in a, in a clinical workflow. Uh, let's see whether that movie works, yeah. Um, so we first acquire CINE images, then we accept or reject having a trained network. Um, those rejections, those would be, because retrospective, those patients would have to be rescanned. Of course, we can now go one step, a step back, in fact, and actually redo those. Then we do a full cycle segmentation. So do a full cardiac um, senior segmentation. Then we compute parameters of interest like ventricular volume curves. Um, then we do another quality control step where we look at the profiles of the volume curves for LV, um, RV consistency, filling and ejection points. So we can again accept or reject, right? Because the segmentation quality may not have been good enough. And only then we would accept the ventricular function parameters. So we compared this to what a clinician would do, and we reached with that for our clinical fellow, who is really excellent, uh, human level accuracy. So very, very good um, agreement um, in total. So um, this was done on 700 cases, 500 healthy and 200 with ischemia. And, and based on these ventricular parameters. So this is now starting to be put into, into a clinical workflow. This is something we can actually run side by side with, with experienced cardiologists um, as well. And actually starts becoming a really helpful protocol. And then the most recent bit, just a few minutes left, I hope, uh, was to actually also think about active imaging. So when to stop scanning? So we know, People use undersampled case space. We know there's also motion corrupted case space, which we make sparse by removing the bad lines. But maybe even when we just start acquiring, could we stop earlier? Could we decide when do we have enough information just to make time maybe for more, more relevant protocols for patients? So the aim there is to accelerate the scanning while still having enough image quality for the downstream task we're interested in. So again, we started with biobank subjects here, 200 healthy and 70 with cardiomyopathy. Just a cross-section through the normal population in the UK reveals, of course, people at that age have already some, some health problems. That's the, one of the key research questions, actually, from UK biobank. Can we detect those? Um, and then we perform retrospective, in this case, radial undersampling, because it's a bit more, more relevant in cardiac. Um, so we went from Cartesian sampling before to, to radial one. Uh, and did several quality checks. Again, look first at the reconstruction quality, so good, bad quality check. And then we, the second check was on segmentation quality again. And then we did clinical function assessment. And we basically were able to reduce the scanning time per slice uh, from 12 to four seconds uh, on average. Um, so we can apply this as, as generic um, uh, reduction time with, by staying within a 5% error. So this is work from Ines Machado, which we um, presented at, Mikai, at a MICA workshop last year. 
And you see here the whole overview. We start from the left with the MRI position. We do the undersampling. Um, then comes the first quality control step uh, where we actually classify images in good and bad quality. So at what level of undersampling would it still pass that check is the question. Um, then we do the full cycle segmentation. Then we do a segmentation quality check directly on the on the segmentation maps. Then we only then we do the volume curve analysis and go go through the puncture parameters and diagnosis. So the final thing, just two minutes or so, I want to spend spend on domain shift. So this is when when things go wrong. So basically, when you go from one hospital to the other, from UK Biobank Siemens scanning systems to Philips different field strength scanning systems in your hospital. So basically the problem there is that machine learning models do not have such a great generalization capability if you don't have enough data. Um, but um, and also if it is on the same quality data, 1.5 Tesla, Pont Philips or Siemens, or good quality on either does not agree very well with our, our algorithms. Um, so we, we looked here at cardiac MRI, we looked at different scenarios, uh, different scanner types, different field strengths, uh, we stayed away from the scanning protocol, which was close enough. Um, of course, there's a problem of different annotations done by different people, we always have that problem, so it's also a domain shift if you think about it. And of course, patient demographics, disease status and so on uh, is, is an issue there. So here we just looked at four different domains, uh, Siemens 1.5 Tesla scanner, Philips 1.5, Philips 3 Tesla, and then the Siemens PET-MR 3 Tesla, where we also do some cardiac scans sometimes, not the PET, just the, uh, just the MR. We had different numbers of subjects, so there's a class imbalance problem, so we only had 42 on the, on the last one. Um, but we started also splitting the domains, so our numbers getting smaller and smaller, so we're looking, looking for each scanner type, uh, for healthy, uh, for two kinds of cardiomyopathy, um, dilated and hypertensive, and, and then also hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So actually our smallest group is only eight left. Uh, so that's, that's not very good. I'm surprised how much you can do with so little data as well. Um, we also did some mixed domains. So the first mixed domain is just uh, all the healthy subjects. And the second mixed domain is then um, the ones with, with uh, these two types of um, cardiomyopathy um, as well. And then we had the, the third uh, domain, which just is mixing um, healthy and, and, uh, and some myopathy together on one scanning system. So lots of stuff to do, lots of numbers. Uh, you would expect lots of good things to happen along the diagonal in this matrix, saying if you scan on a, if you train on A1, whatever domain that is, I think it was just a Siemens 1.5 uh, uh, healthy um, against uh, itself, it would do best, but not necessarily. So we actually found some inconsistency and we also found some asymmetry as well. So for example, the mixed domain, um, uh, performs quite quite well on three of the nine domains and uh, a second on, on the best performance on four. So mixing data, having more heterogeneous, more diverse data in the first place usually helps. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's a nice finding, I think. Um, the other thing is that we, the cross-domain performance wasn't symmetric. So on, on this domain, C2, trained on, uh, trained on C2, tested on A1, fails, whereas if we uh, train on A1 and test on C2, it works well. We don't know. I think my my argumentation for that is that um, if you if you train on diseased patients, that the healthy and um, the the normal variation of anatomy is so varied that it's not captured anymore because it's occluded almost by the pathologic patholo pathological variation. Yeah, and and that that is an issue. So you need to think about that when you design your experiments. I think I'll skip those. Um, although one thing we found that intra-scanner volume overlaps turned out to be higher than cross-scanner volume overlaps. That's for both left and right ventricle and both end systolic and, and diastolic frames. But the scanner difference was, was seemed still to be the dominant factor um, contributing to the cross-domain performance drop. This is still active work we're working on and we're looking now at, at more clever kinds of data augmentation to overcome some of these issues. Uh, also, what helped uh, for mixed scanner training, um, it, 
which is in domain performance when we just have enough subjects. So basically you have more variation of subjects, uh, even though it's, 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 it's all over the place, the data actually helps. Um, and then we get which with that also better generalization performance on unseen domains. But this gap closes as the training sets become larger. So let me just finish here. So AI enabled imaging has the potential to be really transformative in healthcare. And the nice thing about machine learning AI, as people call it, but it's actually deep learning what we do is it, it can operate along the entire imaging pipeline, not just on reconstructed images, but you can look at all the individual steps. And the more you understand about the individual steps, the more you can actually exploit that as well for diagnostics and prognostics. Somehow my, ah, it's frozen, okay. Um, so we've looked at image quality control here, mainly for reconstruction segmentation analysis. I think it's really helpful just for very basic things, just curate your data set, just sort out the good from the bad, from the ugly. Ideally to restore um, the images, but maybe restore with a certain downstream task in mind already. For example, the joint reconstruction segmentation, but you can think about regression or classification there as well. Um, it's really nice to think about now prospective quality control checks, so we can really move into active imaging while we're imaging, we can discard uh, um, case baselines, or we say we have to keep on scanning because it's not good enough for a segmentation task, and then domain generalization is, is, is a big issue, but I think we can get a handle with that, and hopefully we get more data, I mean that's the main problem with us. And then hopefully we can actually not only work across all these, these uh, different things, but we can actually also think about more end-to-end -end approaches. Do we need images at all? I annoy radiologists when I, I say that, but um, the data is already there in the sensor data, right? This is where the information already sits. And every other step, if you just concatenate all these other steps, you introduce an error at each individual step. Yeah, so you actually accumulate errors if you do it one by one. So if you would could do it straight, it might actually be more accurate in the end. So I want to acknowledge all these wonderful people from the Smart Heart grant, one of the nicest grants I've, I've worked on and um, we're still going and we're just thinking about round two right now. Uh, and then I mentioned a few of these things, Mika goes to Africa, I'm super excited about that. So we've just, we're just launching in the Africa network. It's a network of African researchers, graduate students, joining we have already I think 200 people joining and we only did the call two weeks ago so I think it's it's really lifting off um, that's my main work for the next two years at least um, we are running a workshop on biomedical image registration um, there's a call for short abstracts uh, soon if you like motion problems that's the way to go and Munich is lovely it's a nice place to be we also started, like Lena did, the challenges special interest group. We've just launched a um, special interest group on biomedical image registration. So hopefully great things will come of that. And my other baby here is um, the Melbourne Journal. It's a free open access peer reviewed archive overlay journal from the community for the community. And there'll be lots of um, nice events happening uh, in conjunction with that. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Julia. Yeah, the, for those of you who don't know the Melba Journal, it's, it's pretty cool because you, yeah, you, you get the review directly for your archive paper. I, I really like that concept. Um, yeah, very impressive. Uh, also great to see that you're putting your, your work actually into the clinics. I, it always sounds so easy, but I think it's half of the work. So um, yeah, that's, that's great. So uh, for questions, you can use the chat. Um, I already see a question. You can also use the raise hand button. So, Albrecht, do you want to pose the question yourself? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, I was wondering, um, yeah, you spend so much work on uh, trying to get these errors out of the images, if there maybe was a way to circumvent um, the generation of these corrupted images in the first place by looking at the e e ECG triggering and maybe look into where these false false images, these false triggers coming from. Yeah, I mean, the big problem is getting this data retrospectively, because um, I think the way it's stored, it's printed out and stored as a PDF or something. So you don't get the raw numbers anymore from the ECG triggers. 
So we can't train retrospectively classification networks on the ECGs anymore. So that's a, that's a setup problem. I think it's not an unsolvable problem, but I think if you move into active scanning, you might want to monitor the ECG signal as much as you want to monitor the, the scanning itself. And, and then you could maybe run even faster detection classification network on just the ECG trigger as well. So it's a, it's a good point, but we don't have that data. We don't get it, unfortunately. Um, we haven't trained, we, we have simulated it for a while. We just looked at a, at a simulation of that. Um, and then you can actually combine it. There's nothing that prevents you and in throwing it into your network as well as an additional aid. Um, so you could use it to stop the scan and say we have to restart or something in principle, but it's just because you don't have access to the data. Where do the false triggers come from? Well, that's, these are cardiac patients. I mean, they have arrhythmia and other things, and this is exactly their problem almost, right? So it's, it's almost a chicken and egg problem that the ECG is not regular and then things fail. So it's more common with patients to have this, these kind of data than with volunteers. That's why in UK Biobank, we didn't have that many data. Um, to look at. Um, and maybe as a follow-up question, would it then be possible to use the ECG of a uh, of a patient with arrhythmia to predict um, the the false triggers that that are coming from that? Well, these are these variable devices, even right. Um, this is the stuff which people have to wear for a couple of days, um, just to monitor the ECG signal, and and that's that's really more as a precaution to monitor them over time uh, when they are actually active or, uh, or, or at rest. Um, so this is just normal cardiac care, actually. Here, the ECG trigger is just applied to get perfect images, ideally. Yeah. Okay, thank so you. So one is a diagnostic tool and the other one is more like a, it's a bit like a navigator tool, if you want. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, there's actually a question <laughs> on Mikai. Mihiretu, do you want to speak up yourself? Lovely question. <laughs> Are you asking yourself? So first of all, what we are going to do, oh, it's okay. Um, what we're going to do, um, so we've already did a survey for people to, to um, to join the network, but Africa.org is a website that's just being built, should be up in the next two or three weeks, I hope. So this is where you can also sign up. The Mika Society is, um, you can always sign up. There's a student um, discount. Um, in, in, in Africa, even that discount might be too expensive. So this is what Lena said, I'm pushing for, you know, making things cheaper for students because it's even $10 might be difficult, even the transfer of money sometimes might be difficult just because there are no public funds available. Um, so, yeah, but as a student, you can always join Mikai if you've got the funds and hits for health, should be rich, should be able to afford it to you. Um, but you can, if you recommend to your colleagues, africa.org would be the first stage. And what we're trying to do in the run up to Mekai, to run already lots of workshops, summer schools um, in, in Marrakesh, we want to run a virtual summer school or winter school, we're not quite sure yet. And a real one next year, like almost like a test run for Mekai. Um, and there we really want to connect to the community there. And we want to help people to actually you know, raise awareness of Mekai in Africa but also raise awareness in Mekai for, for African healthcare problems, because we, you know, we're working on luxurious UK biobank data, but that's not data you might find outside of Cape Town, maybe even, or, or, or Cairo maybe. So it's, it's really, if you go to, to poorer countries, you might not have that. They might have more X-ray or ultrasound, more affordable imaging devices, which is also an exciting area. And we want to promote those imaging methods in, in Mekai as well. Yeah, so not work on super duper seven Tesla brain data, but actually on on um, acute care data, on data where you just you know have to deal with not experts even acquiring the data and trying to make sense of it later. Mm. Um, do you have a more technical question? Um, so you mentioned the end-to-end -end training, and it makes sense to me that yeah, maybe we don't even have to reconstruct the images. Let's work work on the uh, raw data in order not to introduce errors, etc. But when you build these, say, complex architectures, how do you decide 
where the bottleneck is. So, I mean, you, you, you get an initial performance and there's so many things that you can play around the, you know, the individual, individual architectures or the, how do you weigh the loss, uh, loss function components, et cetera. So how in such a complex system, how do you decide <laughs> what, where to start the optimization? Well, first of all, the system we're using are not complex. We try to keep them as simple as possible. I mean, they're much more complex systems. More, 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 I mean, more generally speaking. Yeah, 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 more generally. I mean, uh, well, in the end, you do empirical testing. And at, at, in the end, you have to do trials, right? You have to put it to the test. You have to do um, blinded studies uh, where you compare your method against clinicians' work, where you actually um, are blinded to the answers as well. So that's, that's the ultimate test to get regulatory approval. Um, in the meantime, you do benchmarking as we all do, as we work on challenges and so on, like M&Ms and, and Stockholm challenges and so on. Uh, you do hyperparameter tuning. So you start learning maybe the weighting factors and the loss functions. Ideally, I'd like to move us into the direction that we also learn the loss function and, and not just put our mean squared error terms in there or you know, structural similarity index or whatever, but actually there might be an optimal loss function for a problem, right? So could we move there? Um, so we could be, everything could be trainable in the end, mm -hmm. but then the explainability will be more, more difficult. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's an ongoing problem. We compare, uh, we have on more data, uh, swap between sites, um, train on one side, test on the other. That's how you make progress, right? Um, and, but the actual question, I think, how can you do it if you do end-to-end -end training? How can you make sure that things in between don't go wrong? I think it's always good to have still this modular approach. So you can test each individual component separately and justify it to the clinician. So it's a bit more like a systems analysis approach, a systems engineering approach that you actually are sure about input output at each stage. But actually I start thinking more and more that if, even if it's just to reconstruct data, we're losing, right? We're losing information. And, um, and, if, and that ripples through. <laughs> if, at every step, we will lose something or we introduce an error. Um, and so even if you take the systems approach, um, you will get a different answer because you might have, have a bias, you might drift in a direction. Um, but the, these end-to-end -end ones, they, they have to be very specific to a problem. I think you can't just have one general problem solver there. You just have to say to detect that kind of condition, then it might work. Thanks. And with that, I think we're actually right on time. So thanks everyone for coming. And uh, most of all, thanks to you. Thanks to you, uh, Julia, for speaking here on your very interesting work. And yeah, Doreen, I, I leave you the concluding words. Yes, so thank you very much for this great talk and also Lena for sharing the session. Yeah, we are at the end. So everyone, thank you for coming. Stay healthy in this Corona times and see you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.